We've been going all the way through this chapter, looking at each of the examples given here uh, on living by faith. And today we're looking at verse 28. Verse 28. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Let's pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for your blessings. We thank you for your mercy, that it is unbounded and uh, free. Lord, we thank you that your mercy is available to all who would come and seek it. That you are a God who is ready to pardon, ready to forgive, ready to save. And we thank you for that. Lord, we pray your blessing upon our thoughts this morning as we look into your word. May we uh, know uh, your Holy Spirit's voice as he speaks to our hearts. May we receive what you have for us this morning, ready, willing, Lord, uh, to take on board what it is that you want from each one of us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got a bucket list of places I like to visit. Um, thank, thanks to God, I've been able to make a few takes on that list. Uh, there's a whole host of things I know I'll never get to see in one lifetime. But one of the more adventurous things in the back of my mind I'd like to do would be to go on a safari somewhere in Africa. Uh, since I was a kid, I've loved watching the nature shows. You know, when they take you to these exotic places like the Serengeti Plains and you can see all the animals. And I thought it would be amazing to go and, and see the elephants and the giraffes and the lions and the leopards and all those kinds of things. I've seen these animals, like most of you have, in the zoo. Uh, but wouldn't it be amazing to see them in their natural habitat, where they're free to roam? I've never liked seeing wild animals in cages. Much prefer to see them freeing, living free as, as God intended. One species you can find, find all over Africa is the impala. I think, or the roibok, I think as they call it in Afrikaans, I'm not sure. A beautiful species of antelope, amazingly agile. <coughs> They can jump as high as 3 meters, and they can cover a distance of 10 meters in a single leap. That's the length of this whole sanctuary in one jump. But amazingly, despite all of that, these magnificent creatures can apparently be kept in an enclosure with a wall only about a meter high. And the reason for this is, for all their ability, they will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will fall or land on the other side. Now so far, we've been making our way through Hebrews 11, we've learned that faith is the ability to trust in what we cannot see. The impala can be kept imprisoned by a little wall, a wall that it could easily jump over, but all because it refuses to see what lies, it can't see, it refuses to jump because it can't see what lies beyond. You know, we can be a lot like the impala. How many people are, are kept back in life because they cannot see what lies beyond? How many individuals feel trapped because they can't see a way out? Their fears and their anxieties hem them in on every side and they live their lives weighed down by a burden of guilt that threatens to swallow them up in sorrow and despair. And yet, for all this, Jesus comes to us with this amazing promise. If you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. <laughs> And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He says to you, trust me, trust in my word. I will keep my every promise to you. Trust in me, and you will be free. <coughs> free from the chains of guilt that would keep you down. Free from the fears that hem you in on all sides and block out the light. Free from the power of sin and death. Free to live your life as God intended. And yet, how many people struggle on through life, never knowing that this freedom is within their grasp? All it takes is a leap of faith, throwing yourself on the boundless ocean of God's mercy. An act of faith, trusting in the Lord and in the certainty of His promise. The American poet John Greenleaf Whittier put it like this, the steps of faith fall on the seeming void and find the rock beneath. Trusting in a God you can't see can sometimes seem like you're taking a big chance, like a foolish thing to do. 
But when you open up your heart to believe, you discover that Jesus is the surest foundation on which to build your life. Through the many ups and downs of his life, Moses learned to trust in God. He learned that the one certainty he could trust in above all, all, above all others, the one friend that, he, that, that would never let him down, was in fact the Lord himself. God kept every word that he promised to Moses. Others would come and go. Others would try to deceive him. Others would lie to him. But God never. Moses learned not to trust in this world. He learned not to trust in the treasures of Egypt. He learned not to give himself over to the pleasures of sin for a season. He learned rather to trust in the invisible God. You can say, how can anyone in their right mind trust in something or someone they cannot see? And yet, you can do it all the time. <clears throat> Have you ever seen an electric current? Yet, you know, trust that when you flip that switch on, the lights are going to come on. Have you ever seen an atom? Has anyone ever seen an atom? Yet, is there a sensible person today who doesn't know and believe that all matter is made up of atoms? So you see, we all believe in things we can't see. The real question is this. Do you believe in God? <coughs> is there any reason good enough why you shouldn't believe in Him? Has He ever been proven false? Has he ever failed? Having faith in God is not so foolish a thing after all. Indeed, the fool is the one who doesn't realize his or her need for God. The Bible tells us it's the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. It's the unbeliever who has been duped. It's the one who says there is no God who has been played for the fool. The Bible tells us that it's the God of this world who has blinded the minds of those who believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the very image of God, should shine unto them. Well, Moses learned to trust God. And because he trusted in God, God was able to deliver his people. He used Moses to be the one to lead his people out of slavery and through the wilderness to the promised land. This brings us to our text, verse 28. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Before God would deliver his people, God, the, the, they first had to learn a lesson to trust him and obey his word. They had to learn to trust him no matter what, or taking them out in the wilderness would be a disaster. They were to face the severest of tests. But through his example, Moses encouraged the people to put their faith in God. And as a result, the lives of countless thousands were saved. To understand the significance of this verse we're looking at tonight, we need to be, uh, this, this morning, we need to be aware of the condition of the Israelites at this point in history. They were not a free people. They were an enslaved people living in the land of Egypt. Now, turn back to the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, and pick up from there. Just drop there. There we go. All right. It's difficult for us today to imagine what it was like to be a slave. We are living through one of the most extraordinary periods in human history. I think it's safe to say there's never been such a time in all history when so much of the world's population have enjoyed more freedom than we do today. But sadly, there is still slavery in the world today. Sometimes it goes by a different heading, human trafficking. But it's still the same evil at root. People trapped in a life not of their choosing, existing merely to satisfy the whims and the desires of others, 
often greatly abused. They live out their lives in utter hopelessness and misery. What does it mean to be a slave? It means having no personal identity. Rather, your property. You belong to your owner in much the same way as he, he owns a house or a car or a pet animal. Often you're deemed to be subhuman, that you, you have no so-called human rights. You're bought and sold without regard for your welfare, without regard for your feelings, your wants, your wishes, who your family is. You can be separated, never to see them again. Your master has complete authority over you. You often have little or no recourse to the law. And you can have no hope for dreams or goals of your own. Because you have little to no ability to better yourself. <coughs> Living without hope. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. It began innocuously enough, but little by little their freedoms were slowly taken away from them until they realized too late that they'd been reduced to slavery. And they served a cruel taskmaster. Look at chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, The Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the fields. And all their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. We noticed last week that that word rigor has to do something with the idea of back-breaking work. They were forced against their wills to do back-breaking work. But at least one good thing came out of all this suffering and hardship. Turn over to chapter 2 and verse 23. And it came to pass, oh, yeah, chapter 2, 23, it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage and they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of their bondage. The hardship drove the people back to God. It brought them to the end of themselves. It drove them to their knees. To the point where they recognized their only hope was in the Lord. And God heard their cry. Look at verse 24. God heard their groanings. God remembered his covenant. The promise that he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel. And God had respect unto them. God began to move among his people once more. He begins to put things into place. In answer to their prayers. He sees that Moses is where he needs to be. In order to lead the people to freedom. I don't have time this morning to go into the whole story. But God came to Moses while he was hiding away in the backside of the desert. And God said to Moses, Go, go back to Egypt and speak to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses does what he's told. He appears before Pharaoh and makes his request, but Pharaoh turns a deaf ear to Moses. In fact, he makes things much worse for the people. If you turn to chapter 5, Exodus chapter 5, and look at the opening verses and see what happened here. Verse 1 says that afterward Moses and his brother Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with sword. And the king of Egypt said to them, Why do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people off from their works? Get you to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many. And you make them rest from their burdens. And so Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmaster to the people and their officers saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the tail, the quota of the bricks which they did make heretofore, you shall lay upon them. You shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. And therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. 
Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labour therein, and let them not regard vain words. So most, uh, Pharaoh issued his decree. The Israelites, he said, they have it too easy. They've got too much on their hand, time on their hands, and so they're thinking about freedom. So let's increase their work quotas, make them work harder than before. When the Israelites hear about this, they start to complain. But they don't complain to Pharaoh, the one who issued the command. No, instead they turn on Moses. It's your fault. If you hadn't said anything, he might have left us well enough alone. But you couldn't keep quiet, could you? You just had to say something. And now look at us. We're worse off than ever. Thanks a lot. I can just imagine at this point, Moses must have felt personally like a complete failure. He'd done what God had asked him to do. And look how things had turned out. Where was God now? Where were all those brave promises? But you see, we can have such small vision. Our perspective is so limited. Our sight can be so narrow. We want everything done. We want it done our way. We want it done now. According to our time scale. But God is operating on an entirely different scale from our own. When God is at work, he's working on many levels all at the same time. There was far more at stake here than the people could ever have guessed. But God understood what had to be done. And so he sets about putting his plans into motion. Yes, initially, for a time, things did get worse for the people. Sometimes, it's a sad truth, but sometimes things have to get worse before they can get better. God had his reasons. His reasons were good, and they were right, and they were just in every way. Well, Moses does what any of us should do when we find ourselves facing circumstances we can't understand. He took his complaint straight to God. Look at verse 22. This is chapter 5 now, Exodus chapter 5 and verse 22. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, why have you so evil and treated this people? Why is it that you sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Why did you choose me? Since I did what you told to me to do, and I went to Pharaoh, things have only got worse. You know, prayer is the right response in any situation. We often speak of prayer as though we're the last thing to do. Well, we've done everything else we can do. There's nothing left now but for us to pray. No, prayer is the first thing that we should do. Prayer is the best thing that we can do. Because prayer engages the power of the one who put the stars in place. Look at God's answer to Moses' prayer. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Look at verse 5. I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for an inheritance, a heritage, for I am the Lord. What followed after God made this promise to Moses? It's come known to us as the ten plagues. You might remember those stories. God sent a series of calamities upon the land of Egypt, one after another. 
In each, there was a purpose. In each one of them, God was progressively revealing himself in power to the people, both to the Egyptians and to the Israelites. Did you ever wonder why God chose those particular ten plagues? Again, I don't have time to go in it, into it today, but each plague was a specific attack upon a false god worshipped by the Egyptians. You see, when God finally brought deliverance to his people, there was to be no doubt in anyone's mind, Israelite or Egyptian, who was responsible for their deliverance. God will not share his glory with another. And when the Israelites were at last set free, no one could say they'd done it in their own power. With each devastating plague, Pharaoh's heart only became harder. It wasn't that Pharaoh couldn't believe. The evidence was mounting, and the evidence was clear. It all pointed to God. Even his own advisors came and told him, This is the finger of God. No, it wasn't that Pharaoh couldn't believe. It's that he refused to believe. And the more he refused to submit to the truth that was staring him in the face, the harder his heart got. Now you know, that's exactly like people today. People don't believe in God because they can't. People don't believe in God because they won't. In the arrogance and folly of their pride, they refuse to acknowledge God and humble themselves before Him. They think they know better than God. They think they don't need God. And they foolishly act as though they can resist the power of God. And the longer they hold out in unbelief, the harder the hearts become toward him. Well, the day came when Moses went to Pharaoh one last time to tell him a tenth plague was on its way. A plague so unique, so unnatural, that there could be no doubt in anyone's mind it was the hand of God. The night of God's choosing every firstborn in the land, child, human, or animal, would die. And yet, even at this late stage, God shows mercy. There was a way of salvation provided to anyone willing to take it. If you want a deliverance from the sentence of death, the first thing you need to do is to take a lamb and prepare it for a meal. And as the instructions unfolded, we read it just a few moments ago, not just any lamb. It had to be a lamb without spot or without blemish. Turn to chapter 12. There's symbolism in all of this. It's quite significant. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. Can I pick up where we read a few moments ago? Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take them every man a lamb according to the house of the fathers. A lamb for each house. If the house be too little for the lamb, well, let him and his neighbor next to his house take according to the number of people in each of the homes and, and eat accordingly. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, male of the first year, and you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day. And of course, on that day then, they were to kill the lamb and roast it for a meal for them and the family. I think it's interesting, quite by the side, that provisions were made to prevent there being any food waste. How very modern. That's by the by. The lamb was prepared for a meal. And verse 8 says, They shall take the meat that night, roast it with fire, and then they were to eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. Vegetables. There was a practical purpose for this meal. Unbeknownst to the Israelites, they were about to be set free. They're about ready to take a big journey. This would be their last chance for a substantial meal for the foreseeable future. God was ensuring that they were well nourished before they set out on a long and arduous journey. Look what it says in verse 11. They were to eat it, what? With their clothes on their back, with their shoes on their feet, and with their staff in hand, because they, and they were to eat it in haste. Why? Because they were about to be set free. But there was more to this command than just God's concern for their physical health and well-being. There's something else here going on. Something of great spiritual significance. Think of it. A lamb 
had to be slain. Why? So they might have something to eat, yes, they could provide them with life and health and strength. A life was taken, a lamb was sacrificed so that they might have what they needed to live. Those of you who know your New Testament and the Gospel of Jesus Christ, well, doesn't that start to ring some bells? I've heard this before. Notice further, even the blood was not to be wasted. They were to take it and to apply it to the front door of their house, and not just in any way. Very specific instructions were given as to how the blood was to be applied to the door. Look at verse 7. It says, You shall take the blood, strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door posts of the house, wherein you shall eat. In fulfilling these instructions, the people were actually signing the cross in blood across the front door of the homes as they put it on the top, the top post and on each side post. They could not possibly have known, but they were giving testimony to an even greater deliverance that would come in another day and for the whole world. What was the point in their applying the blood to the doorpost? Verse 12 tells us. Because that night, God was going to pass through the land of Egypt. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, would die. Verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a sign on the house where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you. to destroy you. If you want to be saved, if you want to see your family and your loved ones saved from the destroying plague, then you absolutely must see that the blood has been applied to the door. The blood was the one thing that would protect them. If it had been applied, then when the judgment of God fell upon the land, everyone in that house would be saved. They would be safe, unharmed. God would pass over your home. And all inside would be left in safety and peace. Hence the term Passover, feast which the Jews still celebrate to this day, in remembrance of God saving his people alive. So you see the significance then of what's being commanded here. A lamb, a lamb without spot or without blemish, had to die. A lamb gave its life so that others might live. The blood of the lamb brought deliverance from the judgment of God. Well, that's all very well and good, you might say, a great story. But why is it included in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter on faith? Well, stay with me here. Because the lesson before us this morning goes right to the core of the Gospel. It goes right to the core of what we, as Christians, believe. Turn back now, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to finish up there this morning with our text. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 and verse 28. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. God had given the command. The command was clear enough. Apply the blood to the front door of your home and all will be well. You'll be safe. But now the people themselves were faced with a choice. Whether to obey the instruction or not. Whether to do as they had been instructed and kill the lamb and apply the, door, uh, the blood to the door. Or to ignore the warnings and instructions. And just get on with life as usual. Those who paid attention to the word of God and obeyed. They were delivered. Those who did not suffered the consequences. And you'd only obey this command if you thought it would do any good. You'd only obey this command if you believed. You'd only heed this warning if you believed God and what He had to say. If you didn't believe, it wouldn't make a difference. If you didn't believe that God would judge the land, then why would you bother? So you see, in the end, applying the blood of the lamb to the door post and lintel was an act of faith. If you didn't take the warnings, you didn't take the promise of God seriously, then you wouldn't bother with obeying. You wouldn't bother with doing it. 
Of all the plagues that God brought down on the land of Egypt, this final plague was the first and only plague in which an act of faith was required if you would be spared. If you had enough faith to believe and submit to God's command, then you would be saved. If God's hand of judgment fell upon the land, He would pass over you. Literally, He would protect you. He would stand guard over you. The blood in this case was the sign of the individual's belief in God. It testified to his trusting in the promises of God. And that's the reason why this incident is included in Hebrews chapter 11. As one of the great examples of faith. Moses believed God and so he did what he did. And he instructed his people to do the same. And all who followed his example and trusted in the Lord and did what they were told, they too were delivered from destruction. So let's bring all these thoughts together this morning. The Israelites, as we noted, were an enslaved people. They suffered in great affliction and sorrow. They longed to be set free, but they lacked the power to be able to do anything about it. So God steps in himself and provides the solution. He comes to deliver them. He comes to them with the offer of salvation. But they must have faith. They must have faith to believe, the faith to obey. And all those who believed and obeyed were delivered. And what was the end result of those who trusted in God and obeyed? Well, God kept his word to them. They were delivered. They were set free. Right, you may say. I get it. It's a great lesson in faith and obedience. And their faith eventually resulted in their being delivered from the enemy, out of slavery. But what does that story mean for us today? Well, here's the link. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we read these words. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The Apostle Paul is making an analogy here. He said, if you can understand the story of the Passover lamb, then it can help you understand the gospel, the message of the New Testament. It can help you understand just exactly what it was that Christ was doing when he died upon the cross. You see, today we are a lot like the Israelites in Egypt. We too are an enslaved people. We're slaves to sin. Each one of us are born with a sin nature and a tendency towards sin. And our lives are dominated by the power and influence of sin. The truth is so universal that it shouldn't need any explanation. How many of you have ever had a hand in raising a child? Or maybe have worked with children? Then you know what I mean by this. You don't have to teach a child to do wrong. They figure that out on their own very well, very easily. It comes naturally. Children are naturally selfish. They're naturally self-willed. They can lie and cheat, bully, deceive, manipulate, do whatever they have to do to get their way. No, all the teaching and training that we do as parents is to do what? To get them to do right. Because that doesn't come natural. We are born, as we might say then, as slaves to sin. We're not our own master. We may delude ourselves into thinking that we're in control. We might say things like, I'm not a slave. I can live the way I please. Nobody tells me what to do. But the truth is, we fight and struggle every day against temptation and sin. And just when we think we've won the victory, we fall flat on our faces all over again. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 puts it like this. Whether we realize it or not, we live following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the hearts of those who disobey God. Seeking to satisfy the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And as such, we leave ourselves open to all of sin's harmful consequences and, and ultimately to the wrath of God against sin. Sin is a cruel taskmaster. It will deceive you, it will use you, and then it will leave you with nothing but sorrow and ruin in the end. And just as God looked down from heaven and saw the plight of his people in ancient time suffering under the yoke of slavery in Egypt, so he sees us today in our sin and sorrow. 
And just as God brought deliverance to his people in olden time, so God has brought deliverance to us today. That deliverance is in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He became our Passover lamb. As the scriptures tell us, we're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. You can't buy your way into heaven. No, we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. 1 John 1 7, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. And Jesus came into our world ultimately that he might give his life a sacrifice, that he might shed his own blood to bring us forgiveness, to set us free from the heavy hand of sin. But if you would benefit from God's offer of salvation, then you've got to do it his way. You as an individual must respond in faith. You need to come to God and believe in Him and obey His word to you. Look back at verse 6 in Hebrews 11. By, but, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. And the blood of the Lamb must be individually appointed, appropriated, applied. It must be applied to the door of your own heart if you would be saved. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. We will share fellowship together for all eternity. When we come in faith to Christ for salvation, what does he do for us? He sets us free. Free from the power of sin over us. Free from the wrath of God against sin. Free from all of its eternal consequences. Free to serve the Lord in faith and love. Free to enjoy all the blessings of God, both in the here and now and in the ever after. God's great design in offering you the gift of salvation is that you might be delivered. That he might set you truly free in heart and mind and soul for all eternity. John chapter 8 verse 36, Jesus said, If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. By faith, Moses trusted in God that he would deliver his people. By faith, those who trusted in the Lord and obeyed his commands, they too were delivered out of sorrow and oppression. And by faith, we too can be set free if we put our trust in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, our Passover, our sacrifice, our Savior. Just a few thoughts then from this passage, a portion of God's Word. If anyone here with questions of